But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And this was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, of all that we see and all that we experience, this morning we come before you acknowledging our weakness and need for you in our lives. We come to worship and we come to glorify you. As we come around your word this morning, please open our hearts to your spirit's leading. Teach us around your word, challenge us and grow us according to your will. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So when Dad asked me to preach, I asked him, do you have a passage in mind? And he said, no. So I had a look and I just thought, well, we've got a whole Bible. That's a lot of different texts I can look at. But as I was considering, the last few weeks we've been looking at the I Am statements of Jesus. So we've been looking at Jesus' character, learning more about who he is and what he means to us. I thought, we're about two weeks from Easter. So maybe we should look into a little bit of depth as to what Jesus means for us and what his sacrifice and what his life means for us and those of us who believe. And so that's how I came to the text this morning. So the text this morning, it's uh, found in what we call in theological circles, atonement models. You'll notice that the word models is plural, so there's a few of them. So what they do is they focus on atonement. Does anyone know what that word means? It's a great word. It's a word that's predominantly only used in Christianity and and Judaism. But the basic meaning of it, especially in our circles, is that it's the reconciliation of God and humankind through Jesus Christ. So at one moment, it's the process of bringing together the reconciliation of God and humankind through Jesus Christ. But how does this reconciliation occur? And how is it that the relationship between God and humanity is restored? And what does that look like? And that's the goal of the atonement models. You might notice on the screen in a moment there's quite a lot of them. And that's only a few of them. And each of them has their biblical merit. And together they collectively paint a beautiful mosaic of God's revelation through Jesus to us. For this morning... I'm going to focus on what we know in Romans. So, Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul didn't follow Jesus' earthly ministry. We don't really know exactly what he was doing at that time. In fact, once Jesus had died and uh, ascended back to heaven, Paul was actively trying to destroy Christianity, as they called it, the way back then. But he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And following that conversion experience, he then became the greatest apologist known. He became a great missionary. And so it's in the book of Romans, or the letter of Romans, where he's writing collectively to a bunch of churches there. So in the text this morning, we find three questions that Paul is addressing. Number one, and that's how the righteousness of God is revealed in the present time. Number two, how justification is now possible for all who believe. And number three, why God chose to demonstrate his righteousness in this way. So from verse 21, For now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. In other words, The righteousness of God has been manifested through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. It's different to the law, what we find in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. 
But Paul's also clear not to disregard the law. The revelation revelation through Christ is indicated and indeed foreshadowed through the law. But some way, somehow, through Jesus Christ, God manifested his righteousness in a new, fresh and distinct way. So what does this mean? First thing to look at is the idea of righteousness. What is that? So, the original Greek word, dikaiosene, in a broad sense, refers to the state or condition of something or someone as they ought to be. So in reference to God, it emphasises the condition and the virtues acceptable to God. So when we talk about the righteousness of God, we're talking about the virtues and condition not only of God himself, but also of what God upholds to be the standard and of what God accepts. So secondly, we now understand that God has revealed his condition in a distinct way from what was known in the past. This new revelation doesn't do away with the Old Testament and the Old Covenant where God made promises to the people of Israel. Paul makes this very clear when he says that the law and prophets bear witness to it. Despite being a new revelation of God's righteousness, there's a clear link and and continuity throughout salvation history can't be ignored. If the Old Testament didn't foreshadow and prophesy about Jesus Christ, how could we know that he was indeed the Messiah? So this revelation came through Jesus Christ and it is only through faith in him for all who believe. And here briefly, Paul briefly hints at something important. He uses the words, all who believe. So in God's kingdom, there's no difference between a Jew or a Gentile, no difference between a man or a woman, no difference between a business owner or the homeless, no difference between race. The only parameter is whether you believe. So Paul continues, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. There's a lot of big words in there. Paul makes it clear, it's a blanket statement. All have sinned, And we all fall short of God's glory. Every single one of us. No distinction. If you're alive, you're a sinner. And you can't attain the glory of God. Why? Because we don't have the condition of God. We're stained by the fall of Adam and Eve. And nothing we can do will change that. And that's our plight. And that's the issue that stands between us and God. But yet despite that, it is God, not ourselves, who provides the solution. And indeed, this solution, Paul tells us, is the justification of all who believe, according to his grace, through the redemption found in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Jesus Christ. So the next question, what's justification? Anyone know? If I'm going to look at the original Greek text again. So, we look at the, uh, the word, it's dikaiumenoi. You'll notice it's a very similar to the word for righteousness that we discussed earlier. So the idea of justification is that righteousness is imputed upon you. You are declared and made righteous. So when we're talking about justification, we're talking about the idea that God declares us those who believe through faith in Jesus Christ, he declares us as acceptable to God's holy standards. No longer do we miss the mark, but how does that happen? How is it that through Jesus Christ, our nature shifts from unacceptable to acceptable? Well, Paul continues and he talks about redemption as available through Christ. We all know what redemption means. You walk into a store and you see a nice shirt. Maybe not this one. You can't grab it and walk out. You have to purchase it. 
But here's the beauty of the gospel. It's not like paying for a shirt with a credit card or cash. Yes, the store can and does happily accept that payment. But the gospel is more of an act like a gift card. See, the cash or a credit card is an act we involve ourselves. The funds are only available to the store due to our action. The gift card is already there. The ca- sorry, the cash is already there with a gift card. The store already owns it. All we need to do is present ourselves and be available. So our ability to receive the gift is entirely on the hands of the person giving the gift. That is God himself through Jesus Christ. So how does that work? And Paul talks about it in this way. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So propitiation is a rich theological word and it's really the nucleus of this whole idea of atonement. If you go to Bible college at some point or another, they're going to talk about the Greek word hilasterion. And that's the word that's often translated into Bibles as propitiation. But what does it mean? It's not a word that we encounter regularly. And that's because our culture has moved past the idea of appeasement, which is the turning away of wrath or indignation. Before I briefly mention that there's a continuity between the Old Testament and the New. And this specific word is one such example. Hilasterion is used twice in the New Testament. The other one is found in Hebrews 9 verse 5 where it's often translated as mercy seat. Anyone know what that is? Beautiful. Both directly relate to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant and the Jewish practice called the Day of Atonement. Let's go for a walk down memory lane. You'll find the passage about the Day of Atonement in one of the least read books of the Bible, found in Leviticus 16. So inside the holy place, the very inner section of the tabernacle and in the latter days, the temple, you'd find the Ark of the Covenant. So on the screen, you should find a rendering of what it might have looked like. But during the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sacrifice a bull and one of two goats as sin offerings, the bull for himself and the goat for the nation of Israel. The high priest would then sprinkle some of the blood of each animal onto the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. It was an act of atoning for the nation's sin. So using the language we discussed earlier, the sprinkling of the blood would restore the condition that humankind could not grasp and it restored the nation's union with Yahweh. So returning to our text in Romans, Paul is saying that Jesus' blood is the atoning sacrifice we all will receive by faith. The language he uses is not bound by time. Where once the Day of Atonement was an annual event, in the words of David Peterson, through the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross, Christ is now the decisive sin offering for all who believe. It's the blood of Christ that allows us to have peace with God, to be justified in God's eyes. but of all the ways that the creator of the universe could return the peace between us. Why did he choose the death of his son? God is all-knowing and powerful. Couldn't he find another solution? So Paul continues. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It comes down to two key lines there. Let's look at the first one. In his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. God, the creator of all we see, all we feel, all we taste, all we hear, everything that we experience, God is fully sovereign. He's in control of everything in this life. 
We could certainly spend a whole sermon talking about that alone. But in this condition, Paul argues that through the blood of Christ, God passed over former sins. By shedding Jesus' blood, God exercised divine patience and restraint to essentially ignore, overlook, and even forget the condition that we, as, a, as humans, experience. So remember the language before. God's righteousness becomes imputed upon us. Often when we look back at the Old Testament, we could be tempted to think of God as easily angered. But that's not the case. He shows divine forbearance, meaning he's slow to anger. His judgment is perfect. And he gives us our space to make our own life choices. Through Christ, God overlooks our condition. And when we have faith in Jesus, we become children of God and we receive and experience the fullness of God's love for humanity. And Paul's second line is equally important. God's demonstration of righteousness occurred this way so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's a fine line here. As we look back on the Old Testament, there are many rules, rituals and regulations that God calls for the nation of Israel to follow. If I'm correct, I think it's over 600 of them. Good luck remembering that many. And when talking about continuity between the New Testament and the Gospel era and the Old, it's important to remember that they meld together actually really well. With the relationship between Jesus and the Day of Atonement, it highlights that God isn't interested in leading us up the garden path. He's not a God who changes. The Old Testament was not wrong. The sacrifices and all that occur there, whilst they might seem odd to us today, they still highlight and reveal truth about God. And that truth is continued, indeed fulfilled, through God's Son, Jesus Christ. And here we could delve into a deep discussion about the divinity of Christ, and the doctrine of the Trinity. But suffice to say that as God's Son, it enabled God to offer salvation, justification and sanctification to humanity, whilst upholding and maintaining his own righteousness and perfection. Through Jesus, God could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in his Son. And that's the key to this whole discussion. Theories are great, but if it isn't personal, what's the point? So as we reflect on the Christian story, the great story of the world as it is now, and as it, and as it is yet to be, we see that, the following, that following the fall of Adam and Eve, humanity has been in a spiral of rebellion against God. You can just read the book of Judges and you'll be able to see that. But through Jesus Christ, and yet with patience, God continued to reveal more and more about his character to bear witness to his glory. And through Christ, God in human flesh, he found a way to maintain his own righteousness, but also give us the gift of righteousness. And we can have friendship with God because of Christ. So this morning, do you have faith in Jesus do you have a friend in God? So, I like to end every sermon that I do with some practical application, a spiritual discipline. If you know Jesus and if you follow Jesus, where do we go from here? Well, let's grow the relationship. Let's deepen it. Let's stay connected to that vine. So spend some time in prayer. If you've got busy days like me, Here's an easy spiritual discipline that you can use daily. It's called the examine. So that examine is, is uh, used to review the day and to align yourself with God. Firstly, give thanks to God for all he did throughout the day. Perhaps give thanks for a specific thing that occurred. It could even be so simple as water. And then as you begin... 
your reflection. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and draw you closer to Christ. Ask questions such as this. As I reflect on the day, where have I felt joy? What things troubled me? What was challenging? Did I get a chance to pause and to reflect? Did I get a chance to rest? And have I noticed God's movement in any of this? After this time, then respond to God and reflect on where the next few days, weeks and years may lead. Make a conscious decision about how you wish to move forward into the next day. Walking in step with the Holy Spirit. This process can be long or it can be short. Every day is different and there isn't a better way to finish the day than to realign yourself with Christ. So I invite the band to come back up as we go forward from this morning. Let's draw near to God. Let's draw near to God in worship. One of the best ways to align ourselves with the will of God is to place ourselves before him.